Hello, Python coders. This is once again Alan D. Moore, author, programmer, bacon connoisseur, back to tell you more about some Python basics and help you to stop shooting yourself in the foot. Because you're good people, and I like you, and I do not want your metaphorical feet riddled with metaphorical bullets, because that's metaphorically messy and painful. Today, we're going to talk about exceptions and how to not do them wrong. And I see them being done wrong in a lot of code that gets posted up to Reddit or GitHub or wherever else people post code. And I want to show you how to do them right so you don't get confused. So what I've got here is I've got a little script that I wrote that uses requests and it tries to download a URL that you enter at the command line. It tries to parse out the text, make it uppercase, and print it to the console. And this is all being done in an infinite loop, as you can see, so that if you should enter an invalid URL, it will just keep asking you to do so until you give it a valid one. To test this, I've got a little HTTP server running on localhost, which we can test using curl. It's on port 8000. It just says hello there. Okay. So now let's try it with my Python script. HTTP colon slash slash localhost 8000. I got a network error. Try again. Let's try again, okay? Localhost 8000. Oh boy, network error. So what could be my network error? Let me cancel out of that. Now I just showed you that the network service is working, uh, even though the astute of you may notice that I'm not connected to Wi-Fi at the moment, but nevertheless, I'm just trying to talk to localhost. It is definitely working. Well, the problem up here is in the way that I'm doing exception handling. All right, so to explain the problem that we have going on here in this script, let me give you a quick analogy for exception handling. So imagine that you are the lead developer uh, in a software team, and you have a bunch of junior developers that answer to you. Now, if a junior developer is working and suddenly finds that the dev server has gone down, they're not going to do anything to fix that. They're going to come to you and they're going to say, hey, dev server's down. And it's going to be your responsibility to either forward that up the chain or to contact the sysadmin and get that fixed. If a junior dev is working on a new feature and finds a library that maybe is going to help, but maybe that library has kind of a weird license situation, She's not going to just take it upon herself to decide that that's okay. She's going to bring that issue to you. And it's going to be up to you to forward that maybe to the legal team and get that worked out. Um, so any kind of problem that a junior dev runs into that is outside the scope of their responsibilities and their authority, they're going to bring to you and it's your job to handle that issue as a lead developer. What those junior devs are actually doing is they're raising exceptions. They're basically saying, hey, this problem is something I can't deal with. It's above my pay grade. I'm going to bring this to the person who gave me this task and let them sort it out and tell me what to do. So now imagine if you were that lead developer and the way that you handled any kind of a problem was to basically say, well, we're having network problems and to pass that up the chain of command. Whether it was, you know, uh, Bob is out sick today or Alice doesn't have documentation on this feature or someone has a question about the legality of something, any kind of problem you just say, hey, we're having network problems, can't work, and you pass that up the chain of command. How long do you think you'd keep your job as lead developer? I'm going to say you would probably be fired pretty quickly. 
But that's exactly what we're doing with this exception handling right here. So we've got this block of text and we've given it a task. Okay, and at some point, this block of text is going to encounter something that is outside the scope of its responsibility or its authority or its ability to handle. And it's going to raise an exception. Now, I understand why we want to catch exceptions. Nobody wants their software, when put in front of a user, to crash with a huge traceback and all kinds of code and errors popping out everywhere. So what we try to do is we catch these exceptions and we maybe try to think, well, what's the most likely thing to happen? Uh, probably a network error is, is, is happening here. So we'll print out a friendly error. We'll be friendly to the user and say something like, hey, there's a network error. Why don't you try again? Right? And you see this all the time in programs. How many times have you had a program tell you, connectivity error, check your internet and try again. And you check your internet and your internet's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. But this thing keeps telling you, hey, there's, a, there's an internet error. Your printer's not plugged in when your printer is plugged in. We see that kind of thing all the time in software. And it's absolutely infuriating when software does this, when it tells you something's wrong and you know that's not the thing that's wrong. Well, more than likely, what's happened is somebody has said, well, here's the most likely bug, so if there's any kind of problem, we'll just print this error and make the user deal with it. Well, that's a terrible approach, okay? Because whenever we use accept without specifying an exception type, we're essentially saying any kind of problem that happens in here, whatever it is, could be a syntax error, could be a, a, a bad value, could be anything. Whatever it is, just say there was a network error and make the user type it in again. That's pretty terrible, so let's fix that. So the first thing we ought to do to fix that is let's actually put in a call here. We'll say raise. Now, if we say raise inside of an accept block, what that actually does is it re-raises the exception that was caught so it, that it's not actually caught in the end, right? So instead of actually silencing or squashing the error, we're just sort of temporarily suspending it while we run this print line, and then we're going to re-raise it, okay? And that way, we'll be able to see what the actual error is. Let me save this. Let's go over here and run. We'll enter our URL. Okay, now we have an actual traceback and an actual error. So response.txt string object is not callable. So what happened here is that response.txt is actually just a string. It's a property, not a method. I assumed it was a method, so I called it. And that's a syntax error on my part. It has nothing to do with the network, does it? The network's just fine and dandy as far as we know. What happened is I made a mistake in calling that method. So let's fix that. Let's run it again. Okay, again, we have another error here. And this time it still has nothing to do with the network. I've called a non-existent method, so Python doesn't have a two uppercase method that's from some other programming language that I must have been writing in. All right, so it's actually just upper is the string method that I want. All right, let's try it again. Hey, it worked this time. Okay, so it worked this time, but surely there could be errors, all right? So what we need to do to make this right is we need to figure out what errors actually might be thrown that we would need to handle, okay? So for example, let's see what happens if we type just gibberish nonsense in here. Okay, so we get an exception request.exceptions that missing schema. Okay, 
So that's an exception that we would want to handle, right? So we could say accept requests dot exceptions dot missing schema. Okay. And we might print something that's a little more meaningful now because now we know more specifics about the nature of the problem. We could say your URL does not have a valid schema. Try HTTP colon slash slash and then we'll put the URL in there. We'll go ahead and make that an F string. Okay. Oh, we got to remove the call to raise here. All right. So now gibberish. Okay. Now we get an error that actually makes sense and suggests something. Okay. So now let's try saying, uh, I don't know, Bob. All right. In that case it failed. So apparently request does not throw an exception if it, uh, if it doesn't have a response, which is fine. So the point though is that we want to catch specific exceptions. We want to catch actual specific problems so that we can deal with them appropriately. Okay. And not just sort of guess at what's wrong, but actually provide some insight to the user on, Hey, here's the problem. Now, if you need to catch more than one, thing, you can add more accept clauses. So we could catch a uh, timeout. And we can go on and on and on with that. But the point is, instead of just assuming what the error is going to be and just treating every single error the same, we are grabbing specific errors and we're dealing with them appropriately. Okay. Another thing we should do here, and uh, this would have helped us in the first place as well. We need to remove as much non risky code as we can from this try block. So for example, retrieving this text is assuming we have a valid response. This is an incredibly non risky operation. There's very little that could just go wrong with this as long as our syntax is correct. And of course, if our syntax is wrong, we don't really want to catch that exception. We want to fix that exception in the code. Okay. Um, there's, there's no reason to ever catch a syntax error. If it's our code, we should just fix the code, right? Likewise, uh, text dot upper is a pretty well established method. It's, pretty much going to work. Uh, if we have a valid response, we can be sure that the dot text property is actually a string and string will have the upper method. So these are not risky methods. Certainly print is not at all a risky method, nor is break. Break is not a risky call. So we want to get all this risky code out of the try block because we don't, if anything goes wrong with that code, it's probably something we can fix in our code and don't actually have to handle as an exception. However, the problem is that all of these things depend upon the response call succeeding. Okay. Well, fortunately, Python gives us something for that. We're going to cut. Python gives us an else clause for try and accept structures. Okay, so anything we put under the else clause is only going to run if this try succeeds. So if this throws an exception, it's going to go to these exception handlers and it's going to skip over this else clause. This will only run if try succeeds. So anytime you have non risky code that depends upon this risky code, you want to put it not inside the try block, but inside an else clause. Okay. That way, if it throws an exception of some sort and you're catching generic exceptions, you're not going to confuse some kind of syntax error for an actual problem uh, with the risky code. 
All right, so a third thing that we should probably do when we're catching exceptions. This is a command line program, so we don't want to print a lot of ugly stuff to the command line when an exception happens. So it makes sense to kind of squash these exceptions, right? Like a missing schema or whatever, or a timeout situation. But we also get a lot of good information from an exception, and we don't want to lose that information, okay? So if you've got some kind of a logging or error output situation, like, you know, uh, if you're using syslog, for example, what we'd want to do is somewhere log that exception. So when you catch an exception, you can not just catch a specific exception, but you can say as E or as error, whatever you want to call this variable. But by using as, you can have access to the actual exception object that was thrown. So then I could say syslog dot syslog, and then I could log that error, right? That way, somewhere as an admin or as a developer, I can go back later and say, oh, you know, well, what were the details of this actual error you got? Because I am still kind of squashing this error and not telling the whole story uh, when I just print this sort of simplified friendly error. So that's a good thing to do. Maybe you can have a switch for debugging mode where it prints more verbose output. Whatever makes sense for your program. But the point is, you don't want to lose this, this exception object. You want to be able to access the important debugging information that's in that exception if there's a continued problem. Okay, so we do that using as and getting the error. Before I go, you might well ask if just typing accept without actually specifying an exception type is so bad why would Python allow it? Is there ever an, a situation where it's okay to just generically catch all exceptions and handle them in a sort of generic way? Well, sort of, okay? I think there's one situation where I would feel okay with generically catching all exceptions. And I'll show you that here. So I've got a little loop here that opens up a, uh, a file that's got basically a basic program in it and it runs through the lines and it tries to split every line at the tab character and break that into a line number and a statement all right and it's going to try this because a line may be poorly formatted and not have a tab character in it and so this wouldn't split cleanly or it may have two tab characters and this would split into three or, you know, for some other reason, there may be a problem splitting this line. I don't know. Maybe there's some kind of weird ASCII character or Unicode character it can't read. Well, I certainly want it to raise the exception, but since I'm in a for loop, it's really good to know what line I was on processing the file and what the data that it was that it was trying to process. So what I've done here, and I'll show you how this looks when I run it. I'm still raising the error ultimately. So I'm not just squashing this error. I'm still raising it, but what I've done is I've added in a print statement so that it shows what line I was on and what the data was in that line. Otherwise, I wouldn't have that. I would get this trace back and it would say line four in the program. Well, line four in the program is right here. But what line in the data file was I on? Because it's probably a malformed line and I'll need to inspect that and figure out why is this crashing? You know, why is this uh, messing up my, my algorithm? So what I'm doing here essentially is I'm adding vital information to the error. 
to the that the exception itself isn't going to have. So that's the only time that I would say it's okay to just blanket catch any sort of exception without specifying uh, and without then further doing something with it other than raising it is when you catch it, add some sort of important debugging information, and then re-raise the exception. It's the only time I would do that. Otherwise, make sure you always, always do these three things. Okay, so let's review. We're always going to catch specific exceptions. No, no blanket catches. We're always going to log the actual exception somewhere or have the option to log it or display it somewhere. And we're always going to try to minimize the code in our try block to just the risky code. And everything else can go in the else block. Everything that depends on that code succeeding. Okay? So you do these things, your code's going to be a lot more robust, it's going to be easier to debug, and your metaphorical foot is going to have a lot fewer metaphorical bullets in it. And that's what we want. So I hope this has been helpful. Happy coding. May your programs be exceptional in their error handling. And may God bless you. Thank you.